I am James Swanick, and today we are talking to Dan Menke, who is a 58-year-old entrepreneur. He owns a computer forensic firm in Sioux Falls in the southeastern part of South Dakota. And Dan drank for over 40 years, and today, as we're recording this, he is now one year and four days alcohol-free. Dan, congratulations, and how does it feel? Thank you very much. Uh, it uh, it's hard to describe. It's a it's an incredible feeling. And you're a uh, pretty fit looking fifty eight year old, and you're a grandfather. You have three grown children and two grandchildren. Is that right? Tell us a little bit about yourself before we dig into the your relationship with alcohol. Of course, yes. I uh, I have three grown children and uh, two grandchildren, ages six and four, and. Uh, I, I live in the southeastern part of South Dakota, which is in the northern plains of the United States, for those who are not familiar with this with this area. I, I grew up in uh, a community not far from, from where I'm at now, in a very small town, and uh, small enough where I had, uh, I think it was 14 kids in my graduating class in high school in that community. And uh, one of the things about growing up in that kind of an environment was alcohol was always readily available and present uh, from a very early young age. What was the alcohol that was present? What type of alcohol? You know, all of the alcohol, all of the various types of alcohol were present, uh, but, but by and large, it was beer drinking. Yeah. Do you remember the brand? What was the popular brand in South Dakota back then? Uh, Paps Blue Ribbon, Grain Belt, and uh, Miller High Life. Wow. Okay. And uh, from what age, what you know, was it present for you? Did it start to to come into your daily life, or did you see it? How old were you? Looking back, I think it became part of my daily life uh, somewhere in my mid twenties. Um, and uh, and has stuck with me ever since. Got it. But your first introduction to it was in your teens. Is that fair to say? Or did, and you only started really getting into it noticeably in your mid twenties, or was your introduction to it in your mid twenties? No, my introduction to it was probably at the age of fourteen or fifteen years old. Yeah, got it. And in that in that culture or society where you grew up. How was alcohol thought of? Like, what, what, what did people think of it? Was it normalized? Was it just something that people did? Um, yeah, it was encouraged. Uh, it was it was more than normalized and more than something people just did. I mean, we 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 centered social events and gatherings around a keg of beer. Yeah, around a keg of beer, not just like a six pack or a or a carton. But a keg. That that that's right, and it was it was readily available to the point where uh, you know the legal drinking age then for for drinking beer in this part of the country was eighteen years old, but in in the small community that I lived in, uh, buying beer at the at the bar slash liquor store uh, was something we we never got carded so. Uh, it would not be uncommon to go to the bar after class in high school and and grab some beer. Got it. Did you get in trouble from your drinking in those early years or was it just like, you know, harmless fun kind of thing? Like, was there any indication that it might become like a more embedded issue later? No, it was, it was honestly uh, very well accepted. And and when you asked, did you get into trouble for it? Well, you know, we only got into trouble if we got into some other form of mischief uh, related to consuming alcohol, and or or if it was obvious that we had had too much alcohol, uh, that would have been frowned upon pretty heavily. And so you mentioned before. Uh, we'll probably do, we'll, we'll probably do this in chronological order because we've talked about the teens and then we'll get into the twenties and then we might hit the thirties, forties, and now you're in your late fifties. So take us back to now the mid twenties, when you said you started to kind of formalize the relationship with alcohol, what were you doing and what happened with your habits around then? 
I was, uh, when I, when I left high school, I, I moved about 60 miles away from that little town into, uh, into where I'm at now in, in Sioux Falls. And, uh, I, I started college on, uh, I had a, a combination of an athletic and academic scholarship, but unfortunately I grew up in a very poor family and about halfway through the, uh, second semester of my first year of college, I had to drop out. Uh, because my father had had a massive stroke and I needed to get into the workforce to, uh, to help provide for my family. And so as, as I rolled into the early 20s, um, I, I, got, uh, I became involved in a relationship. I got married um, at, I think I was 26 years old when I got married and, and had uh, two of my three kids in fairly short succession. Um, so I was, I was out, uh, working 60, 65 hours, 70 hours a week and, uh, trying to, to build a little family and alcohol was, uh, was the great escape, um, uh, you know, in, in, in the late evenings and, and during the weekend hours when I wasn't working. And what were you drinking at that time? Really, at that time, it was still all uh, mostly beer. Once in a once in a great while, someone would would uh, show up with uh, with a bottle of whiskey or bourbon, um, something like that. But but by and large, it was mostly beer. And so, when you said it was, it felt like the great escape. You'd come home after a long day, and then you'd go to the fridge and open up um, a six pack and drink some beers and how much beer did you drink and what was the, you know, like the daily habit, I guess. Uh, it was, it was basically, uh, yeah, right. You know, we come home, uh, and usually it was probably two to three beers on a daily basis. And then when you got into, uh, you know, those events or those days when you had, maybe you didn't have to be to work until noon the next day. Uh, so you had some, you know, uh, more of a buffer, uh, you might be w- more willing to uh, to grab that six pack or or more than that six pack. But basically, you know, it was kind of like life itself, James, in the sense of you know when it, having alcohol being introduced at such a young age to me, uh, I, I I grew up as a human being and grew up as an alcohol consumer at the same time. So as I aged uh, from my teens into my twenties. My my alcohol consumption increased along with the years that I had underneath me. Yeah, so let's move into our our thirties now. So, did your drinking habits remain the same, or how did they increase? Did you move from beer to something else? Did you add some other stuff in? And and at the time, did you realize the impact? Uh, to answer the last question first, I I never realized the impact until. I was in my fifties. I never accepted that it, the impact until I was in my fifties. So it was in my thirties, probably the mid to latter part of my thirties, where uh, other types of alcohol became uh, a part of my routine and a part of my life. I was uh, 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 some bourbon and, uh, and and whiskeys and things of that nature, but I was starting to to now become. A little bit more successful uh, throughout the ventures that I was engaged in professionally, and uh, so uh, starting to drink finer wines and and uh, uh, drinks of, of of that caliber seemed more socially uh, acceptable than just grabbing a beer at the bar. And was that impacting your uh, performance? It seems like your your. your you're actually doing better in your professional life. Uh, so looking back, do you see how your drinking habits at that time, I'm assuming we're now in our mid thirties, right? In our thirties or coming into our forties, are we assuming, are we noticing how drinking is negatively affecting us or is it still, or are we still in that phase of like, Oh, you know, everything's going pretty well here professionally. And so I don't notice anything. I, I felt as though I was more creative during that that time of time each day that you know during that euphoric period 
each day where uh, the creative juices were just flowing, you know, because I was under this influence, the buzz area of the alcohol. Uh, so I was, I was on top of everything. I mean, I had, I had the world, uh, there was no downside to it at all, James. Yeah. And that you probably felt that way for what, all through your forties and, and early fifties. Is that right? I really did. Um, I, I, I can, you know, honestly say that, uh, although I, I woke up each morning in a fog, uh, and I didn't realize how thick that fog had become until I quit drinking alcohol. But uh, I really didn't experience what most people would consider to be classic hangovers, where you know they go out on a bender and then wake up the next morning and uh, you know just totally you know throwing up and and uh, you know just totally out of the out of the picture and out of the game for that day. Uh, that really wasn't me for the most part. Um, it was just, uh, you know, it was like shake the cobwebs off for the couple first two, two to three hours of the day and then go back on with life. It seems like it was that way for a good 20 years or so, was it? Uh, at least 20 years. Yeah. Okay. Did anyone, uh, during that time ever say anything to you drinking, whether it was a family member or partner or or a colleague or a staff member, did anyone ever say anything about your drinking habits? I had two people that, um, that talked to me about my drinking. One was an ex best friend. And another one was, uh, a gentleman who I had had a business relationship with, with a number of years. What did each of them say to you? Uh, it was it was different approaches. The individual who uh, who was my best friend at the time uh, was very blunt and very uh, very forceful with tried to be very forceful with me. And basically, he came in literally came into my home and he gave me an ultimatum of uh, you know this was our friendship and or or you're either done drinking or we're done being friends and um it i chose neither at the time uh i i i chose to continue drinking and i chose to try to maintain my friendship with him uh to later find the testing of that friendship to to become at issue uh during the time that i was uh that i decided to quit drinking uh, if for him to come in and suggest that you needed to stop, suggest that he thought that there was something amiss or something wrong, uh, the way that you've described it up until now is that, um, you know, maybe it was, it was giving you just some creative energy and that um, when you had that buzz at the end of the day that things were going well and you were producing and even though you didn't get the shocking hangovers, you know, you still probably thought that it, it wasn't an issue. So what was it that he thought was the issue with you drinking? He didn't know uh, what, what he didn't know what the issue was. He didn't feel as if uh, he could approach it that way. Basically his approach to, uh, to confronting me with it uh, was, was much more directed toward uh, me trying to live his lifestyle. And, uh, you know, he, he, he approached me or I'll, I'll use the word attacked me. He basically, uh, you know, attacked me by, you know, telling me that I need to live his lifestyle and, uh, and not live the lifestyle that I'm living. And, and alcohol was just one of those parts of it. Uh, but, but the, the problem with it, with him was, the approach he approached me shortly after uh, his parents passed away and they left him a significant inheritance and so he retired at a very young age and uh, moved to a part of the country and bought a big fancy house and uh, doesn't have to work another day in his life and it was after he got all settled in with with mom and dad's money 
that uh, and didn't have to work that he came to me in his fancy new Cadillac and said, all right, you need to live the life I'm living and clean up your whole life. And so, uh, he, you know, to him, it was very simple, you know, just uh, just take mommy and daddy's money and go live this new life. And uh, and, and and his approach was completely ineffective. And was the new life he was suggesting getting rid of alcohol? He, that, that was a part of it. Yes. Mm. That was to him. That, that was, that was, uh, that was what was in his mind. That was what was preventing me to be successful at his level. Got it. And you rejected that notion. Yes, I did. Yeah. And I still uh, do you, quite honestly. Yeah. There was, uh, you mentioned someone else had said something about your drinking. Uh, a, a business partner. Yes. And what was it that your business partner or uh, our business partner saw about your drinking that warranted comment? He, he made a couple of just very honestly, very subtle comments along the way. And as a result, as I look back now, uh, uh, the outcome of those subtle comments uh, ended up being he distanced himself from me, and uh, and that was his way to uh, uh, to not have to deal with it. Did he see something in your drinking though? Like, did he say to you, "You're drinking too much," or "You're you're you know, I see you drinking consistently." Like, did he specifically mention something about your drinking? And if so, what was it? They were they were much more. Um, off the cuff comments that he would make. And, and it was kind of a double-edged sword for him, James, because, uh, he drank as well. And so Mm. it was, uh, as the the saying we call the pot calling the kettle black, um, it, uh, it, it, it really, uh, to, you know, hear, hear words like that from him were really pointless. Got it. So you now, You've had a couple people say to you something about your drinking. It sounds like you've rejected both of those. Um, you know, maybe it's just to do with the, the 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 people who were saying it or putting it out to you. But it sounds like you kind of rejected the notion that you have a drinking problem or there's anything that needs to needs to change. So where did it get to the point where you suddenly realize actually maybe it does need to change? What was happening? What was going on in your life? to warrant you actually finally taking action? I was starting to feel the physical effects of alcohol, years of drinking alcohol in my life. Um, I, I had elevated liver enzymes um, and had uh, some screening for what was diagnosed as a fatty liver, and which I'm here to tell you now, it's, uh, it's, it's completely normal again, according to the test results. But, um, I noticed um, I was having problems focusing. I was having I was having severe anxiety issues, or what I thought were anxiety issues, and uh, what they were in reality was temporary or the short term withdrawal effects of not having alcohol in my system all of the time. Hmm. So you were drinking. Your drinking had got up to what level at this point? When you started to experience what you're describing I, as withdrawal symptoms, I was uh, I was a very cyclical drinker in in the sense of uh, my drinking day began right at the end of, of of my traditional work day at approximately you know around five p.m. or so, and uh, usually would start off with a couple of beers followed by a few uh, bourbon and and sodas and. Uh, then to wrap things up, at least a bottle of wine, if not more, uh, that became that became a daily routine. And that started in your early or mid fifties. I I perfected that craft uh, somewhere between my early to probably closer to my mid fifties, early to mid fifties, I would say. Yeah. So it sounds like a pretty big jump, right? From a few beers at the end of the day to a few beers and a couple heavier drinks and then a bottle of wine then is there any reason why you think it made such a noticeable jump 
uh, at that time? Was there anything going on in your life? Was it just a culmination of, you know, a steady increase over time? Like, was there a catalyst for that? I think that by then my my body had become so accustomed to to having alcohol uh present that it took more more alcohol to uh to get that same sense of that euphoric level that I was able to achieve with uh with less alcohol in the earlier years of my life got it and how long did you keep that pace for I kept that pace until uh November 16th uh, 2019 got it Liter- literally literally November 15th 2019 to November 16th 2019 was uh it, it was the same as an on off switch wonderful well I, I want to I'm going to ask you about that in just a second I'm just curious what was the impact uh, up until November 15, 2019, when you stopped, what was the impact that you, in hindsight, noticed um, it was having on your life or those around you or maybe your your career or, you know, what was the, the negative impact, I guess? I was, uh, it was, it was uh, multifaceted. I was irritable. I was mm-hmm. not, uh, I was not a good person to be around. I was uh, very. Uh, I had a, a, a very low tolerance for people. Um, I was not creative. I was not able to focus on 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 the work that I'm doing at nearly as well as I needed to, and 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 I had lost. I'd really lost any kind of a future vision uh, that, uh, that was always, a, always, always seemed to be present and accustomed to, to my life was being able to see ahead. I, I was not able to see ahead beyond, uh, that next day and that next evening. And I, I, I would plan my, my days and I would plan my schedule around, uh, that five o'clock, uh, couple of beers into the, into the bourbon and into the wine. So, uh, that became uh, the part of my schedule that was most important to me. Yeah. You said that you were irritable, not a good person, low tolerance, not creative, unable to focus, lost the future vision. Did anyone uh, at that time before, you know, in the days or weeks before November 15, 2019, say anything to you, give you any feedback? They did not. Um, and in and, and looking back at that, uh, that time, especially probably the two years prior to uh, when I quit and joined this program, um, I think that uh, it's safe to say that that some of the people who uh, were close to me had probably just given up. Hmm. And how does that feel looking back on that, the fact that some of the people close to you had given up? Um, that is, uh, probably, uh, the most difficult part of my life, uh, today is, is dealing with the, 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 the regrettable decisions that I made in my life prior to, uh, to, to quitting. And, um, it's, uh, as I, I mentioned in a in a recent post on on the uh, the group, talking about uh, you know the 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 downside to being alcohol free is I don't have an alcohol problem today. I just have a life problem uh, because of the regrets that uh, of of the bad choices that I made. So, but uh, the good news is that I now have the clarity and the mindset that I can that I can deal with that. Uh, much better than just uh, uh, going off and forgetting about it for for four or five hours a day. Yeah. So what happened on November 15, 2019? And then what happened in the days and weeks and months after that? I wish I knew the answer to that, James. Uh, November 16th, 2019 was a Saturday here. And uh, I had gotten up and I, I routinely uh, 
power up my laptop computer and check news, weather, and sports. So get an ESPN, check a couple of news sites and check and see what the weather's like. And, and uh, I was actually on social media, which I really don't spend a lot of time on, but I was on social media and there it was, uh, this advertisement for the 30 day no alcohol challenge that came up in front of me. And I don't know, I, I, I looked at it for a couple of minutes and uh, I, I saw that there was a, a fee associated with it. I don't even remember what it was. I think it was maybe $20 or something like that. And I, uh, I don't know what inspired me to go get my debit card. I, I, I signed up for the program right then and there. And I think that that initial connection, I already felt as though I had some skin in the game. And so it was, I, I, I owed it to myself because I just spent 20 bucks on this thing. You know, I, I need something back out of it. And uh, so I decided to, to start, start reading some of the information that was on there, watching a couple of your videos. And, uh, that, that first day was, it was, uh, there are parts of it that I don't really even remember. And not, not just because I was in the fog from the drinking the night before, but because of, of the overwhelming, uh, amount of information that I was just, I was starting to absorb and digest in a way that I never had before. Did you draw a line in the sand when you bought the 30 day no alcohol challenge? Did you have any idea that you would go a year and four days as you are now? Like, was it, that's it, I'm doing this, I'm not going to drink again? Or was it, that's it, I'm doing this, I'm, but I'm just going to try it, I'm going to test it out. Maybe I'll go 48 hours or three days or I'll see how I go with this, but I'm a bit unsure. Like, what was your thinking at that time? Quite frankly, I never, I never bought into the the thirty day no alcohol challenge. Uh, I did not set a goal for thirty days because I knew I couldn't achieve it. There was no way I could achieve thirty days without drinking alcohol. So my goal uh, was one day. That was it was Saturday, the sixteenth of November, twenty nineteen. That was that was that one day, and and I decided that day that I was going to make that day all about me. I was going to eat and drink anything, as long as it didn't involve alcohol, eat, drink, and do anything that I wanted to. And I was going to ignore everybody. I was going to ignore my phone, my email, uh, anybody that wanted to talk to me. I was going to focus on not drinking that day. And I decided if I could make it through that day and wake up on Sunday, the 17th of November, I would then uh, have to decide what I wanted to do with this, with day number two. And when day number two rolled around, uh, it wasn't day number two for me. It was day one again. And yesterday didn't happen. Uh, so the 16th didn't happen. And so before I knew it, I continued with that mindset of waking up each day and literally asking myself, am I going to drink alcohol today? And the, I would have a conversation which lasted usually about two or three minutes. And uh, once, I, once I answered the question and said, no, I'm not going to, I, I, I then tried to just completely forget about it for the rest of the day. I said, all right, I'll, I'll worry about it tomorrow now because I've already made the decision for today. So what ended up happening was after a month or so, I had completed 30 one-day no-alcohol challenges successfully. Yeah. Incredible. So, it, so when, I got, when I got past the 30 days... Uh, I didn't, I, I never, I never set a goal for 60, 90, 180, uh, or a year. And as I sit here now, uh, I, I don't have a goal for two years or three years, uh, or even a year and six days. Uh, I'll wake up tomorrow morning and the conversation will only be a few seconds long. Uh, unlike the three or four minutes it used to be. And, uh, I'll, I'll decide that I'm not going to have alcohol most likely and then just go about my day. And what helped you along the way? Uh, you, I saw that you were active 
in the Facebook group of the 30 day no alcohol challenge. And I'm assuming you digested some of the videos that you get inside of that program, maybe after the first day or so. Was that helpful? Or did you kind of like just get the information that you felt you needed in the beginning and then kind of like handled it yourself? Like what was, you know, what was helpful for you along the way? The, it was the whole package, uh, the videos, uh, some of, you know, the, the material that you and your team have put together, but, um, and I, I'm still fairly active, uh, it, within the group. I, I don't necessarily post as much as I, as I used to, uh, but I'm on, I'm in the group almost every day reading and, um, uh, what, what has really set this program uh to the level that 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 it has become in my life are the people the other people who are members of this group um one of the things when i got into that that first day and i started reading some of the posts by some of the some of the folks that were on here i realized that the, the this group of people uh is comprised of men and women tall and short well educated articulate, uh, successful in many aspects of their life. Uh, they're not the, the, you know, the drunks that are laying in the, in the, in the gutter and, uh, uh, can't, can't seem to get anything in their life going. I mean, these are, these are highly successful people and their stories and, uh, that they, that they talk about the challenges that they face. I was able to, I was able to relate and understand where they were going and and what they were talking about. And so it was that connection with the other members of the group that really kept me attracted and focused to it more so than uh, than the content that you and your team have provided. What happened in the first 7 days that you didn't drink? Uh you mentioned, you know, some years earlier you you had uh withdrawal symptoms uh if you didn't drink as much. What happened in the first 7 days uh this time around? Oh, it was horrible. Uh, the, 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 the first seven days, heck the first three weeks, uh, were sleep was, was horrible. Uh, night sweats. Uh, I, I had no consistent sleep schedule at all. Headaches. I felt as though I had the, the, the flu. Um, my mind was, uh, was racing. Um, I was, I was physically shaking during that time. Um, and it was, my body went through several changes during that first few weeks. And, uh, but, uh, I, I had somehow prepared myself for that subconsciously. And I, I it, it almost became, and I say laughable, uh, I don't mean laughable in a funny sense, but laughable in the sense of each day was, unpredictable. So day days four and five, you know, I, the, the, the curveball thrown at me on that day might've been different from the curveball the day before with the, you know, massive headache or the, uh, you know, sleep deprivation or insomnia or, or night sweats or whatever, or some days it'd be a combination of all of it. It was horrible. Sounds like good times then. <laughs> well, you know, you know, the, the, the good part about it was that after going through, this is going to sound a little bit strange, but after the first three or four days of, of watching, you know, these toxins literally leaving your body, I, I, I gained some traction in the knowledge that I must be making some progress. This stuff really is leaving my body uh, because I've never felt like this before. And um, I, I, I felt some sense of accomplishment by, by sweating this out and by having that headache and by, by uh, not being able to focus on that. So I'd go grab a big bowl of ice cream and, and, uh, and, and get over it. You know, it, uh, it was like, a, a, you know, it was like a, a rite of passage, so to speak. At what point did all of that irritability and the sweats and the poor sleep when did you turn the corner? When, when did all of that leave you? 
And all of a sudden you came out and you were like, wow, I'm on the other side here. I would, I would say, I mean, the, the, the first week was the worst, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, the second week, I think it got better. The second week, probably by the end of the third week, um, into maybe three and a half weeks into it, I started, uh, I mean, the, the type of sleep I was getting, uh, was amazing. The, um, the energy I had was incredible. And, uh, my life was starting to just really come into focus. Much of my life was coming into focus for the first time in my adult life. What about your life was coming into focus? The, the, the clarity of, and the reality of the, of the decisions that I've made that had gotten me to the point that I was at and, and I don't necessarily mean just all of the bad decisions because I made some good decisions along the way as, as a business person, I would be considered to be successful and, um, the, and, and to those who are, are near and dear to me, um, I'm, 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 I'm well loved by them. So, uh, my life hasn't been a complete failure. So it was, uh, uh, it was, it was really having the clarity of understanding the and and accepting and acknowledging the damage I had done not only to my own life but to the lives of others in my life and also accepting and acknowledging the accomplishments and achievements that I had been able to uh to obtain along the way. Mm. What was the impact that it had on you professionally? And then I'll ask you a second question after that. But what was what was the impact that being alcohol free consistently after those first three weeks of the adjustment period, let's call it, what was the noticeable impact that being alcohol free consistently had on you professionally? I, I was able to uh, juggle multiple projects at the same time and, and incorporate visions on how to, uh, uh, to move my company into the you know the next uh, the next phase of of my profession, uh, being in the field of computer forensics or digital forensics, we we used to call it computer forensics. It's now uh, encompasses all types of digital data. Uh, is is an ever evolving and ever changing industry and profession. And I was able to uh, to to keep my business rolling with the current. Uh, clients that I had and also start offering new types of services and new visions for new ideas and, and incorporating those into my life. And what was the impact that you noticed being consistently alcohol free had on your family and personal life? It, uh, on my family and my personal life, um, the impact initially, it was, it was very hard because um, I, when I when I decided to to join this program and decided to uh, become alcohol free, I shut everyone out. I focused on myself entirely, and I, in, in, in you know, in years prior to that, I was always trying to do something for someone else, and I I made it all about me. I it became very selfish. I became very self centered. But I knew I had to do that. I was in this, I was in the fight of my life and I had to put 1000% of my energy on me and I didn't worry about anybody else. And so for the first few months of that, uh, it was, it was a struggle and a challenge for those closest to me. Uh, I'm here to tell you now, however, that I, I don't have the quantity of, of relationships that I had a, over a year ago but the quality of the relationships that I have with my kids, my grandkids, and those who are closest to me it is much, much stronger and more powerful. And uh, the future is so much brighter than it ever has been before. Did your kids express concern that you pulled away during those three or four months where you really focused on, on yourself? Like what was, what was some of the feedback you, you received from your kids then? They they really didn't uh, show much concern. I've always been a a, a very uh, self surviving individual. I've you know I 
you know, like my kids, you know, for example, they, they know that dad's always going to land on his own two feet. And so, uh, I'm, I, I, I don't really require, uh, some type of person to be in my life for, you know, for me to, to, you know, I don't need someone to cook food for me. I don't need someone to provide shelter for me. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, self-sustaining that way. So they, they honestly, they, they reacted by just ignoring me. Uh, and, and they didn't know what I was doing. They, they just, eh, he's going through some kind of phase or whatever. And it really wasn't until probably six months or so into the program. Now understand six months into, into being alcohol free, we were dealing with the, the onset of a pandemic. Uh, so that, that little distraction, uh, threw another wrench into the whole thing. But by then they, they started realizing that, uh, dad's not drinking uh, and hasn't been for some time now. I, d- I never put it in their face. I, I they, but they, but they knew that I had joined the program, and they started realizing that I wasn't drinking, and it started to sink in with them. Incredible. And what was some of the positive feedback you received from either them or anyone in your life after you'd got, you know, six months? seven, eight months alcohol free. What was some of the positive feedback you received? I, I have had people, uh, my kids and family men, members and, and those who are closest to me, um, pull me aside on a number of occasions and just, you know, look me in the eye and go, what you have done is absolutely unbelievable. And, um, and, and it's been a complete cycle. And for, for them visually, you know, when I, when I decided to quit drinking alcohol, I was overweight when I, when I was drinking alcohol, but I gained even more weight after I drank alcohol because I was eating all the, all of the sugar. Um, after you quit alcohol, you after mean? After I quit, right. I, I never had a sweet tooth or I didn't think I did until I quit mm-hmm. drinking alcohol. And then uh, candy bars and ice cream and cake were, uh, I mean, I, I, I was eating and consuming that type of food. So I was gain, gaining weight, but I allowed myself to do that. I thought, you know, if, if, if I'm going to eat a bowl of ice cream versus a six pack of beer, it's a lesser of the two evils. And I allowed myself to do that until about six months into it. And then I, and I realized, you know, I think I've got a fairly good grasp on this alcohol thing right now, at least I'm now going to attack the diet. And so I attack the diet in a way of exercise and, and, and my, my eating habits changed, uh, drastically. And I dropped about 40 pounds and am at, uh, the best health in my life right now. I also have, uh, uh, you know, for years I was on anti-anxiety and depression medication and blood pressure medication uh, those have all become uh, a, a distant memory as well. I, I don't take any of it anymore. Congratulations. You got rid of 40 pounds. I did. And you got rid of prescription drugs. I did. And you got rid of irritability and low tolerance and inability to focus, it sounds like, as well. I did. And I also got rid of toxic relationships, and I had plenty plenty of those. Um that was a big part of the cleansing process was getting rid of those toxic relationships. And, and I really can't stress that enough. I looked at each relationship that I had with people in my life. And if, if the only common element that I had in that relationship was uh, going to the bar and drinking with them, um, it, I was done with it. There was, there was nothing meaningful about it. So I stepped on toes along the way. November 16 of 2020 was uh, four days ago as we're recording this now. So was it just another day or did you wake up and go, wow, give yourself a pat on the back? Were you tempted to celebrate with a drink? Did you celebrate with a tub of ice cream? Tell us about the one year anniversary. I've, I've never been, uh, the type of person who really celebrated anniversaries, birthdays, uh, things like that. It was just really wasn't, was, it wasn't a part of what I did. Um, the, the internal celebration that I had on Monday, this past Monday, uh, 
the this one year was was a much greater than a combination of all of the birthdays and anniversaries I've had throughout my life. Um, uh, celebrating with a drink? No, are you kidding me? Seriously? No. Um, and celebrating with food? I didn't. I I, I was celebrating my life, and. Uh, I did, I, I did pat myself on the back. I took a day and just acknowledged what I have accomplished. And, uh, but then on Tuesday, it's back to day one again. So, but, but for that day I did, I took a time out. Sorry, I got a little choked up there. I want to acknowledge you for being so courageous and vulnerable and sharing your story with us, Dan. And I want to just say congratulations to you for an incredible achievement. Well, thank thank you, James, uh, for for those kind words. But more than that, thank you for having your vision and having um, the entrepreneurial spirit to to put this program together and save the lives of of people around the globe every day. That's got to feel good for you. Thank you. Yeah, it does. It does feel good. I, I, you know, with, with, without this program, I, I wouldn't have done this. I, I, I know that I wouldn't have done this. Um, I was not, uh, I, I have a couple of, of, of friends or acquaintances that have gone to AA and I just hearing their stories, AA was not going to be for me. I never, I have never attended an AA meeting. And I have no desire to attend one. I'm I'm sure it's great, but it I knew it wasn't going to be a fit for me. We've talked about the massive impact that it's had on your life, which is incredible. And now, uh, and probably what's already been happening is the massive impact that your new way of being will have on others. So who in your life gets to benefit and is benefiting? right now because of your new way of being well in in somewhat reverse order my 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 staff and employees are certainly benefiting from it which of course my clients are 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 benefiting from that as well my my kids and my grandkids are are certainly benefiting from it um my 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 partner erica uh is uh the rock of my life and without her, um, I, 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 I would not her her steadfastness and support that she has given me along the way uh, has been so instrumental in in my life. Um, and I know that she is benefiting from the rewards of seeing what what I'm accomplishing each and every day. And what's what's so interesting about about that with her is there have been aspects in her life that uh that she's taken a, a hard look at and uh and 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 she's she's experiencing some some new wonderful gains in her life she never had a, a, an issue with drinking alcohol but just some of the other areas of her life she's seen the success that that I've had with this program and has uh taken it upon herself to uh to address some of those things in her life and has been wildly successful. So it's been a great ride. Yeah. Just an incredible journey you've been on, Dan. Yes, sir. Does it feel that way? Uh, it, it feels absolutely unbelievable. Maybe being 58, you're only just getting started as well. Maybe this is like the next phase is, is going to be just so exciting and adventurous and impactful not just for you, but for other people as well. Does it feel, feel that way? It, cer- it certainly does. Uh, at 58 years old, I'm, uh, I, I'm in the, the transition part of, of my company. I actually own two, com- two small companies, another, another business here in, in this area as well. But I'm transitioning my, my businesses into ownership by my employees. And uh, I've got plans for for retirement, and I plan on retiring within a few years. And I've got plans uh, that uh, will take me to other places in the world and do things that uh, are are way beyond my wildest dreams. Uh, are, it, we're, we're beyond my wildest dreams just a couple of years ago. Mm. 
Wonderful. Well, Dan Menke, 58, from Sioux Falls in South Dakota, who drank for over 40 years. And as we record this today, is one year and four days alcohol-free. Congratulations. I so acknowledge you for your transformation and for your commitment. And uh, long may it continue, Dan. It was a real pleasure to hear your story and uh, be able to share your story with some folks who may be listening or watching now in the hope that certainly they'll take that first step as well at some point or it will help keep them on the path. So thank you so much again, sir. I so appreciate it. Thank you so very much, James. Thanks for listening to the Alcohol Free Lifestyle Podcast. I want to load you up with some free stuff right now. So if you want to go to jameswanick.com slash guide, I will send you my Quit Alcohol Guide, which has helped six-figure entrepreneurs and top professionals reduce or quit drinking. You can also text the word Quit Guide to the number 44222 if you're in the US, of course. It doesn't really work anywhere outside of the US. But if you're in the US on your mobile phone and you'd like that guide, text the word Quit Guide to the number 44222 or you can go to jameswanick.com slash guide. If you'd like to schedule a free 15-minute call with one of my top coaches, just an exploratory call to see if or how we can help you, then you can go to jameswanick.com slash schedule, or you can text the word project90 to the number 44222 if you're listening in the US on a mobile phone. That's jameswanick.com slash schedule, or you can text the word project90, that's one word, project90, to the number 44222. Feel free to send me a direct message over on my Instagram account, which is at James Swanick. You can also watch video episodes of this podcast and a series of other educational videos on my YouTube channel, which is James Swanick One, or you can direct message me on Facebook at James Swanick Official. And finally, a request. Would you please now write a short review of the podcast inside of the Apple Podcast app on your phone or on iTunes on your desktop? Computer. Would you please give the show five stars and write a quick one or two sentence review? This will help the show get in front of even more listeners, potentially transforming someone's life. You can rate and review the show inside of your Apple podcast app on your phone or over on iTunes on your desktop. Thank you so much and I'll catch you next time.